Hi, it's Joyce Lynn Akuflo here. I'm the Managing Director of Geek School Tutoring. So today I want to talk about, sadly, the reasons why some children don't pass the 11 plus exams. And I know that around this time of October, a lot of you are still receiving results from various schools. And in this month of October is generally when the secondary application forms go in, the CAF forms. And so there's a lot of thinking, a lot of good or bad feeling because of the 11 plus exam results for some of you. A mixed feeling for those who maybe have passed some but haven't passed others. And there are some students that will be celebrating for the rest of the academic year because well done, you made it. Good. Today, though, I want to talk about why some children don't pass the 11 plus exam. And I know it's quite a tough thing to experience at such a young age. However, it's an experience that you can take and do something with. You know, I don't believe that uh, failing the 11 plus exams or not being selected or maybe passing but not passing high enough to be able to um, put down your school of choice or to be selected later on in the summer or spring should I say. One thing that I do want to say is it doesn't mean that you are a failure, it doesn't mean that you will fail everything in life, it doesn't mean that you will fail your GCSEs, your A-levels, um, your degree or that you will not get to university and it doesn't mean that you can never get to a grammar school that's the other thing there is something called the 13 plus although the spaces are very much limited it's still a possibility perhaps for a school or schools within the borough of interest and then you can actually try and get into grammar schools again after your GCSEs I know it sounds like it's ages away but basically you start somewhere in year seven so you're there year seven year eight year nine year ten year eleven just five years of your life and to be honest you're eleven when you're 16 it's literally you've just dipped your toe into life you know i'm not even sure what the average age is um in terms of the lifespan of people, but it's definitely a beyond the 70s. So you've got so much time in life, five years to wait to then just do amazingly in your GCSEs, enough to be able to go to grammar school, to do your A-levels and then get to a really amazing university. It's not that long. So if you're in that position, I want to say don't lose hope, okay? And this thing just keeps on flicking all the time. Oh, can you see? Okay. We have calm. Okay, so why do children not pass the 11 plus exam? First of all, the 11 plus exams are not catered for by the national curriculum, especially if it's an exam that includes verbal and nonverbal reasoning. It doesn't cover, the, the national curriculum doesn't cover that. So you won't be taught that in school. And so in the exam, unless you've been prepped outside of school, it's going to be difficult. It really is. And I'm always amazed at local authorities who just say, oh, here's our familiarization booklet and if your child does that a few times or, or and such then they'll be fine I mean their parents struggle to do it and they're several decades older and um, how do you expect a child to just walk into an exam in September having never been exposed to verbal or non-verbal reasoning besides the eight to ten examples on the familiarization booklet and be okay. It's bizarre to me. You need to get the practice in. So that's one of the main areas there where um, children eventually just failed the exams because the verbal and non-verbal reasoning isn't something that's covered in school. And if you go to a state school, they're definitely not covering it. Some prep schools, so private primary schools, cover it. But for a lot of them, it means 
oh, here's a verbal reasoning sheet once a week. You will do it at home, bring it back, we'll mark it and that's it, unfortunately. So even the fee paying primary schools don't necessarily teach the children how to do verbal, how to do non-verbal reasoning. Is it necessary? I believe so. And because the exams are getting increasingly competitive every year, and especially SEM papers, um, for example, for the Bexley test, they are trying to make it preparation proof, whatever that means. How can you be unprepared for maths or English, for example? Bizarre. Anyway, so that's one of the main areas. A second reason why children do not pass the 11 plus is because they don't practice enough. So a lot of children will get 100% on these papers. It, I know it sounds like, um, <laughs> like a tutor who is just trying to make it seem as if they're really, really hard. They are not hard to get 100% on. You know, um, there are students that do consistently get 100%. I've had a student who used to get so upset when he got 98%. I mean, can you just imagine that kind of mind, you know, and that 98% would often just be one question that was wrong um, in a paper that he was doing. And um, half the time he was torn between the correct answer and another answer, went with the other answer and didn't get it. So got 98, you know, so there are a lot of children who are like that. Are they walking geniuses? No, a lot of them have just been really, really diligently working towards these exams for a number of years. And uh, does it mean that you have to literally from the womb, from the labour room, spend your every waking hour doing 11 plus preparation? No, it doesn't actually. So I have loads of students who start in September of year five with a very softly, softly approach because I don't believe in adding unnecessary stress to the lives of children and their parents for the exams. It's about teaching some skills, knowledge, and um, how to do things and how to, um, how to answer questions for the grammar test, which is a different format to what children are usually used to, in that they are multiple choice, you've got to shade in or draw a line through boxes, and so on. So the lack of practice, it's like, imagine that I just decided today that I'm going to run the marathon and I barely do any walking, let alone the actual exercise of, you know, running and building myself up to being able to run 26 miles or whatever it is. And then on the day, I just think, right, today's the day I've slept early. I'm going to do this, you know, would I even get a quarter of the way? Probably not, you know, unless I was somebody who, um, <laughs> a miracle, basically a miracle. It just wouldn't happen because you have to train for things. Um, I don't know why in, when it comes to academics, some teachers or, um, even some parents, unfortunately, they just seem to think that if their child has to do more practice, um, than, you know, a couple of weeks or um, the summer before the exams and they're not in the right position to be going to grammar school. Why? Why? You know, you wouldn't see Olympians, children who are um, taking part in Olympic, um, in the Olympic Games, just turning up to do a gymnastics routine and expect to go home with the gold. Listen, even the bronze would be completely out of reach, you know, top 10. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, so they often aren't doing enough practice. And then there are the other group of children who, you know, throughout primary school life, they have never really been reading. They often don't know their times tables. They struggle with the basic operations, long multiplication, division, like the bus stop method. Um, they'll do column addition, but if it's addition, they'll be subtracting and vice versa. Or they are just quite confused with the fundamentals. And really, they need another six months or something worth of 
literally just going through their work and finding out where the problems are and practicing and honing in on their skills so that they can do these exams. And unfortunately, because the 11 plus has become somewhat of a hidden secret, many parents are unaware of its existence or even the existence of these grammar schools, especially if they don't live in the borough for which the grammar schools are, in which the grammar schools are. And so their children are never gonna get the equal chance of gaining entry because other children have been practicing and being prepared in one form or the other since they started school, you know. At Geek School, we have children who are in reception and their parents just want them to be ahead in school. And then, you know, when they get to like year four or year three to start thinking about the 11 plus, that's how far ahead some parents are preparing their children. So it's often quite unfeasible, in particular for the grammar school tests, to expect to start at the end of July and that the child will be at that high standard by September when the exams are. You know, it's, it's just unnecessary pressure and it often doesn't work. Yes, there are some really bright children who can pick things up very quickly, but then they probably get a lot of support from parents at home in terms of, you know, encouraging them to go through papers, maybe marking it and explaining things. That's like tuition, but a lot of parents don't discuss that. You know, they'll just say that, oh, we used a tutor. Or some of them won't say that they've been helping their children. They'll say, oh, you know, um, Sarah only did a couple of papers before the exams, but did you go through the papers with her and teach her all the areas that she um, got wrong in the papers? If you did, well, it was more than just doing a couple of papers the summer before the exam, you know. So a lot of this talk can be quite misleading. I remember when I was at uni in my first year and um, I'd actually delayed doing my theory test because my mum wanted me to focus on my A-levels. And so where a couple of my friends in sixth form had done their driving tests and all of that, I always knew that I would do that after the A-levels. So uni started and I just wanted to not have to deal with the English weather in the winter months. And I was very motivated to do my driving test. And of course, the first thing was to do the theory test. So I booked that think online and um, I was misadvised by a so-called friend at uni who told me that oh you know I only read the book the night before and it was fine and I passed with no issue and so for some reason even though I had weeks to go I didn't get the book early enough because of this silly advice that I had been sold and I left it until maybe like the week before. And so when I finally got myself down to WH Smith's, I think it was, the book was bigger than my Bible. It was so thick. And I just thought, oh my goodness, with lectures um, and whatever else, reading and all the rest of it that I'm doing, when am I gonna get through this book? I'm, it was so massive, it was huge. And even though the theory test is quite straightforward, a lot of it is common sense, you still need to know the technical detail. And, you know, literally the night before, I was just having a panic. I missed it by one mark because of that person's terrible advice. And so I understand what it feels like when parents are on the receiving end of lies, basically. Um, yeah, it's a lie for many children that they can just prepare the summer before the grammar school tests and they'll be fine. You know, if you live in borough, you only need to pass and you're in good stead already. But for children who don't live in borough, the only assurance of being offered a place is to be in the top 180. So out of, let's say, 5,000 or so children, you need to be 
number one top score, number two, all the way up to 180 to be assured of a place. After that, it starts to look, um, starts to get difficult because local authorities are looking at catchment areas and all these other, other um, criteria. And so even if children have scored really well, they might not get offered a grammar school in the end because of all of this, all of this criteria. So that's one other reason. Another reason, some children just don't want to do this and they just don't want to go to a grammar school because they think that when they get to a grammar school, the work is going to be impossibly diffi possibly difficult for the whole of their secondary school life. And they think that they're not good enough. Some of them, even if they are good enough, they don't want to have to work in that perceived way. And they think that going to secondary school would be better for them. You'd be amazed at how many year sixes and even children in year five tell themselves this story and then they just don't work so their parents see them at the desk going through books and papers thinking that oh isn't he working so hard i'm so proud of you and they're not doing the work properly at all you know um, and they know that their parents aren't going to mark the books on time and so on. And even if they do, some of them will tell lies, lies upon lies upon lies about not understanding. When really they sort of made their mind up that they don't want to go to grammar school. <sighs> it's so sad because going to grammar school doesn't mean that your life is going to be full of the misery of having to do this super duper extra hard work that you can't cope with it doesn't honestly it really doesn't um obviously in top subjects like maths and sciences children are usually put in sets anyway so they're put in sets according to ability so if you're a child who maybe struggles a bit with maths or you don't struggle but you're not you know a maths genius or somebody who loves maths you probably wouldn't get put in the top set anyway so you're not going to be around ch excuse me children who live and breathe maths as if you know in the way that you live and breathe oxygen it's just not going to happen that way and it's so sad when children talk themselves out of really taking a really good opportunity like this to get into a really good school then they end up in a local state school maybe not even one on their list and there are issues with teachers um, staff shortages which means that they have loads of gaps especially in the maths and sciences and then you know all sorts of falls apart when it gets to the GCSE exams because they've just had years worth of just a terrible school journey. Whereas over in the grammar schools, they don't have that issue because people want to teach in those schools because the children want to learn and it's just a different environment. They're not having all this behavioral management, you know, a child throwing a chair across the room or punching the guy next to him and all of that drama. It just isn't there in much the same way as in the independent or private schools, you know. So if you are a child in year five or year six and you're thinking, I don't want to go to a grammar school because it's going to be too much hard work or you are messing up your papers and pretending to be working when you're not. You need to rethink that, honestly. I'm gonna put the link down here and I hope it's still active by the time you're watching this video. And it's called Grammar Schools, Will They Get In? It was a BBC documentary. A lot of the documentary really, oh, I was just so upset with, um, especially in episode one, 
But if you are the type of child who thinks that grammar schools are not for you and that you'd prefer to go to state school, you really need to watch episode two of this documentary. And honestly, I don't like betting, but I would bet you any money that by the time you're not even halfway through episode two, you would really change your mind and really start um, focusing on your grammar school preparation. I bet you any money. And, you know, this is looking at two schools, Townley Girls, and I think it was Erith basically a good grammar school and a state school. And looking at the experiences of the students in both the schools, even just the way that the teachers spoke to the students was so different. In one school, they're really supportive and it's like, oh, you know, come and see me at lunchtime and I'll go through the bit you didn't understand and all of this type of thing. And then in the other school, it's, Oh, miss, I really don't want to miss my revision class. But you got a detention. You can't miss your detention. Oh my gosh, for a year 11 student. You need to watch this, honestly. I think every child who's preparing for the 11 plus exams, you really need to watch that program and it will help you get an idea of what all the fuss is about. Okay. And... I think those are all the reasons really. Yeah, those are all the reasons. Obviously there are unique cases. So sometimes you might get a child who has been scoring 100% on papers at home, timed, and they get to the exam, they have a panic attack. Oh my goodness. So another story time. Oh, actually, do you know what? I will not do the story time in this video. I'm going to do it in a different video. Look out for the story time of my first entrance exam. <sighs> Life changing. Anyway, so thank you very much for watching this video. Please remember to subscribe, like, comment and share. Share it to the world, please. <laughs> See you in the next one.